We're going to go over to the next speaker, and his name is Tom, Tom Llewellyn. Uh, the title of the talk is The Response, Building Collective Resilience in the Wake of Disasters. And I read a lot about Tom before we started today, and um, also in a, very, a very inspiring person. Um, Tom works as a community organizer, a consultant, and a storyteller. He's promoting people-powered solutions for the common good. And uh, today he's the Strategic Partnerships Director for Shareable.net, which you have probably heard of, uh, as well as the executive producer and host of the award-winning documentary and podcast series, The Response. He's also the co-editor and author of several books, including Sharing Cities, Activating the Urban Commons, the response, building collective resilience in the wake of disaster, and the newly released lessons from the first wave, resilience in the age of COVID-19. Um, Tom has co-founded several community and sharing-based initiatives, including a place for sustainable living, Asheville Tool Library, Real Cooperative, and the collectively run Critter Cafe. So, um, Please welcome to the floor, Tom Llewellyn. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, feel free to, to uh, open your session. All right. Thank you, Caroline. Um, well, I'd like to thank everyone for, for joining, for, for sticking around for this next discussion. I'm joining you from California, where we are in the middle of fire season. Um, you know, it's... It's become kind of the all-encompassing focus for many people living in California at this point in time. And you know, we used to joke about having two seasons in California. We'd had green and brown. And, and now we have two seasons, but we have fire season and we have pre-fire season. And it's become something that is really quite shocking for, for all of us, you know, that have grown up. I'm, I'm, I'm from the San Francisco Bay area. I happen to live in a, in a small community that has some of the highest fire danger, um, in the region. And it's one of those things that, uh, it's, it, it really makes climate change and the kind of disastrous period of time that we have found ourselves in real and, and tangible. And it's something that, um, you know, it's made it so that I have far more compassion and understanding, uh, and empathy for, for those that have experienced incredible disasters in the past. And it's something that really propelled a lot of my work of late thinking about how do we address this? How do we learn from these disasters? How do we figure out how to work together during these, these peak moments? Uh, how do we get in front of it and build greater resilience? How do we find purpose through taking collective action? And that's something that I'll be talking about today. I, you know, as was mentioned, I, I fancy myself to be a storyteller and, and more than a storyteller, I, I think of myself as a story collector. And so for, you know, the last eight years, I've been working with Shareable, which uh, for those of you who are not familiar, we, uh, you know, most people know is actually more for our publishing, for the stories. And we've published about 4,500 stories at this point uh, in over the 12 year history of Shareable, looking at the ways that people share resources in, in so many different facets of life and in their communities. Um, and but we also, for, for many years, have been supporting groups to start new sharing initiatives, uh, either through consulting and seed grants and, and just general, um, you know, providing how-to guides. And we've actually published about 300 how-to guides at this point, uh, how to share in one's community. And then on top of that, we support other um, organizations and, and people that are, that are trying to communicate about the, the work they're doing. And uh, through that work, we kind of shifted from focusing on, you know, what has become known as the sharing economy uh, and kind of the, a lot of the more for-profit initiatives, you know, that came out of that banner 
uh, to really thinking about, okay, what is it, what is a, a city, what do our communities look like if they were platforms for sharing? And so that's where we started working on this kind of global sharing cities initiative. And now there's over a hundred sharing cities around the, around the world. You know, many of these programs have been completely municipalized. City governments are behind them, are, are pushing them. But, uh, and, you know, and that, that led to us kind of publishing one of our seminal books, Sharing Cities, Activating the Urban Commons, which looks at 137 different kind of grassroots initiatives and also city-led programs to meet our basic needs around food and housing and waste and water and energy. You know, how we're going to be able to do all these, you know, provide all these basic services in our communities. And, and yet, when we find ourselves in this kind of time out of time, in this, in this, this kind of, this time of great, of great change and great turning, uh, it's hard to look at any one of those projects, any one initiative that we may be working on, you know, in, in a bubble unto itself, you know, it, everything that we're doing is contextual. And the context that we're finding ourselves now is, is in one of a great change when it comes to the climate and, and disasters. And so we started thinking a lot more about how these projects that we've been promoting over the many, over the many years, uh, you know, and the projects that we were releasing in our, in our book back in 2017, how they were going to be impacted by climate change, how, you know, how many of those initiatives were going to be, you know, really resilient in these moments. And, and so that, that led us to working on the project that is called the response. And that led to the documentation of communities and their response to disasters and looking at how we can learn from those, take those examples and apply them to other communities to support other communities, to learn from them, to be able to be better prepared from those disasters, for when those disastrous events occur. And, you know, I've got some slides and I'll, I'm going to jump into them in a moment, but I just want to kind of start by prefacing that, you know, as I was mentioning earlier, like we've, we're going to have a lot of disasters. They're, they're happening already, you know, at a, you know, at a great, you know, unprecedented level. You know, we've had uh, a recent story, uh, excuse me, a recent report from the UN found that in the last 20 years, there have been over 7,000 major disaster events causing 1.2 million deaths. And this, is, this was before the pandemic, these numbers. So this is not accounting for the, for the pandemic, but 1.2 million de deaths and affecting more than 4 billion people around the world uh, you know, and resulting in almost $3 trillion worth of global economic losses. But I wanna go back to that number, that 4 billion people impacted by disaster over the last 20 years. That's half the world's population has been impacted already by a disaster. And the other half of the global population will most likely be impacted by a disaster in the next 10 to 20 years that will completely impact their lives. And one of the the most dangerous things that happens during a disaster is what happens after is the secondary harm that can be caused from, from fear of, of neighbors, of, of the others, you know, and this, this has played out in many different ways over time. There's a lot of different examples of, of how this fear has led to greater harm. But one of the ones that I point to quite regularly is Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans and where we saw that there was a lot of people that were trying to get out of New Orleans that had been stuck when the hurricane came that hadn't been able to escape. And as they were trying to get over the, the bridge to a nearby town, Gretna, to get to higher ground, they were met by vigilantes and police who shot and fired rounds to keep them from coming over the bridge. And that story was able to be kind of pushed aside because at the same time, you know, there was uh, this, this whole false narrative, this whole false story about what was going on in, in the Superdome where there was a lot of people were sheltering in place in the big football stadium. And there was all these stories coming out about how, you know, people were stealing things from each other. 
there was crime, there was rapes, there was like, you know, very, very dangerous, uh, you know, things going on, you know, damaging things going on. And it was projected as showing, look, these people have been given a place to shelter and they're responding like animals. And so if they're responding like animals here, then they can only be thought to be responding like animals out in the community. And so that justified the police carrying out extrajudicial killings that justified the slower response, you know, the, uh, the, the privatization of resources after the fact, when the truth is that in the Superdome, people were taking care of each other. It was a community of care. And it was an incredible example of disaster collectivism.